Hello, Colleen. Hi, John. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Okay. So Colleen O'Neill is a licensed educator and divorce coach. She earned her master's degree in social work from Columbia University. She happens to be my alma mater too. Mm -hmm. And uh, she runs a very successful and um, long-term divorce, pra divorce mediation practice called Mediation and Beyond in Westport, Connecticut. So Colleen, please take it away. Thank you, John. So as John said, my name is Colleen O'Neill. I do have a practice called Mediation and Beyond out of Westport. And as much as the mediation for divorces are important, so are all things beyond the divorce, which is what where a lot of people can also uh, find themselves having a lot of problems. And uh, so I'm happy to be able to do these Zoom coaching call, uh, calls so that people can either write in and ask uh, shared parenting questions uh, at info at shared parenting. Um, or they can come on with us and ask your questions. That way you can ask them for a family member, a friend, or for yourself, um, or for your own practice if, if you're working with divorced couples and have some, have some questions. So um, we're happy to do this. They'll be every Tuesday evening at eight o'clock. And hopefully um, if you don't get on it tonight, you can at least let somebody know and listen to it at your, at your own discretion and in your own time frame on um, on Zoom and go to Shared Parenting on their YouTube channel and you can listen to these conversations there. Um, these are not legal advice and they're not mental health advice. They're merely um, certainly professional and personal uh, experiences and information that we have that we think would be beneficial uh, for people to at least consider. Um, so with that said, John, why don't I turn it to you with any questions that you've received or have and we can go from there. Very good. And I just want to say the beyond part of your practice, I think that's so important and uh, really, really important that you emphasize the fact that parents are parents for life. And once they get past this uh, really trying and difficult period of, of divorce and separation and figuring out how to co-parent, you know, just they're to still going to be involved. Right. Just to touch on that, John, I think what happened, I think the difference between what a mediation practice like myself does versus just getting a divorce between two attorneys because once the ink dries you're done <laughs> out the door everybody says goodbye and now you go figure out life and i think there are you need somebody to stay with you so that you can see like the parenting plan you put in place let's see if it actually works so in a practice like mine we follow you to make sure that you don't have problems going forward because what you signed on the dotted line may not work like you thought it was going to work. And instead of running back to court arguing with each other, you can come back to us and we can help you re, re, you know, refine, retune, uh, tweak whatever wasn't working. And, and I like that we follow uh, the family. And so thank you for, for mentioning that. I appreciate that. I think that's so important. I certainly, in my experience and, and what I hear from other people, it requires a lot of flexibility to co-parent or parallel parent uh, children. That uh, there's, they're always changing and the challenges are constantly arising just like they do for an intact family. And, and it's really important for the children. It's important to the children that uh, the parents figure out how to handle those things even though they have separated into different households. Absolutely. Uh, so let's get to some questions. Um, the first question I have is about uh, domestic violence claims or, or concerns about domestic violence issues, which happens to be the topic of our January uh, symposium at the, at the legislative office building. Uh, but I also I'm interested in, in your practice in mediation and beyond. Um, how, do, how do you handle this when domestic violence comes up in, in the discussion? So, you know, this is really uh, near and dear to me because my first job out of college was um, at the Cambridge, Massachusetts District Attorney's Office, and I was uh, a victim witness advocate, and they still, they still are around today. They might have different titles in different states, but you really work with victims of violence. And so I, did, I used to do a lot of domestic violence training for state police and whatnot um, around uh, domestic violence, and I've certainly seen my fair share of victims of domestic violence. By the same token, um, in my divorce work um, and practice, I have also seen um, 
false claims of domestic violence. So I think people have to be very cautious with um, domestic violence. And I know you have your symposium coming up in January, John, about um, domestic violence and, and divorce. And so, but I think um, people have to be very cautious and state laws have really changed over time. I'm not always sure that every state is to the benefit um, of either party. Uh, sometimes you have states where they arrest two people. But with regard to mediation and divorce cases, um, domestic violence, typically you can't come in and just start claiming domestic violence. I mean, you can, but obviously any court is going to look at, is there a history? So has that person um, been to, you know, had restraining orders, been to court, been to the hospital, uh, pictures of things along those lines. So one of the first questions when you're doing a, a little assessment there for a mediation case is to, is to find that out. Um, I never believe in asking that in front of uh, your partner. So, and men also experience domestic violence, so it works both ways. But I'll separate people out and ask that individually because people sometimes don't feel free to speak um, in front of the other partner. And for me, I don't, you can have a couple who has domestic, a domestic violence incident 10 years ago, which is very different than somebody that had it, you know, three weeks ago. And so um, for, a, for a mediation, not everybody is a perfect fit for that. And I think domestic violence is one of those cases where, or circumstances, I should say, where you have to really be cautious um, because you don't want it set up where you feel like um, one of the parties is in a bullying situation or fear-based because that's never going to make for a good, um, a good mediation. But you have to ask both parties if um, either one of them is in a situation where there is current ongoing domestic violence, you know, recent domestic violence. Um, I think most people in the family court should be, I think attorneys, um, therapists, mediators, they should all have training in domestic violence and not all people actually even ask about it. Um, so I think if you're someone who suffers from domestic violence um, current, mediation wouldn't be a place I would tell you to go. I would probably tell you to go get your own attorney um, and because it, it can set up a situation where domestic violence increases if they're still living in the same home, that can be problematic. And so I, I would encourage people um, because you, you might have threats and intimidation. Um, someone else might minimize or blame the other person or just uh, blatant denial that it's even going on. Um, they could use the children as, um, you know, messengers and, and, or they're going to threaten, if you leave me, I'm going to take the children and all those things. And, and so you have to be really cautious as a mediator um, about even accepting a case where you think there is um, domestic violence. And don't forget, domestic violence uh, or violence in general can be sexual, it can be physical, emotionally, financial, and, um, and sometimes just a blend of everything, really. But you have to be really cautious. And um, I think if you have, like I said, if you have an ongoing case, I would probably tell you mediation is not the space to be able to do that. I would rather see somebody do a collaborative divorce where each of them have an attorney and try to mediate out uh, that situation. But you really, that becomes a concern about safety. Okay, thank you very much. That's, uh, that's, a, that's a great answer. Um, well, let's see. Another question we have is um, about non-compliance with court orders. There's a multiple part of this, but uh, uh -huh. I could I could read it um, to get get more of the flavor for it. Um, I am finding that Connecticut family judges tend to punt or fail to adjudicate in cases where court-ordered parenting time is not honored by one of the parents. Some families then choose to involve the police to reconcile the situation when, um, when there's yeah. interference to visitation, when it becomes repetitive. 
and then goes on to talk about the problems with it involving the police and um, and how this can kind of devolve into a self-perpetuating sort of uh, um, exclusion of the parent when when one parent isn't isn't um, uh, uh, complying with the orders. Mm -hmm. So uh, what do you think about that? What, uh, what, oh, what, I'll what tell you, as I said earlier, at the outset of this call, when we were speaking, John, is um, that is, so my practice mediation and beyond, that is the beyond part, right? That's the part where you've signed your divorce, um, you've got, the ink is dried, everybody leaves, and now what you agreed to isn't going like you thought it was. And just because somebody agrees to something doesn't mean they're going to honor it. Those are two different things. And so I'm always going to encourage couples uh, who, who um, are having challenges, if, if it's around parenting or selling of property or financial things, where they're not complying with court order uh, to come back to mediation before they go back to court obviously if you have somebody that's not going to mediate uh, then you you have really no choice especially with the parenting pieces you don't have a choice the cops police really don't want to get involved in these situations um, and a lot of people will carry around their divorce decrees to say but it says and what they're going to basically tell you is go get an attorney go file a contempt in court and but all while you're doing that so you got to get an appointment with an attorney you've got to get on the court docket so you have weeks if not months sometimes that are going by and you you're not seeing your children um, and so people can get really frustrated because the court system doesn't uh, jump on it just because you're not having access to your children and so what will happen is you'll go back to court typically and the, um, you know, people, both parties will go and one will get a reprimand and okay, now, you know, now you need to be compliant. And so then you go back and that you, you it's this cycle. And um, what I would suggest to somebody if they find themselves in that cycle of having challenges, unfortunate challenges of not seeing their children, whether it's the mother or the father, um, I obviously file a contempt, keep pushing the courts, but also get really informed about um, parental alienation early on before it gets too, too out of control and too lost in the system. And because somebody who's not compliant, uh, again, we're talking, you know, basic family. We're not talking that there's, you know, violence to the children or things like that or sexual abuse, anything with the children. Um, because even if people talk about that, it does, you have to be able to prove it. And so um, I would encourage people to start seeking out um, experienced people in the field, such as um, Dr. Amy Baker. Um, she's excellent. She's, I think, out of New York. I, I just did an interview with her a couple of weeks ago. She's on my YouTube channel. If you want to go see it, just kind of the basics. How do you define? How do you know if someone's alienating a child? She's uh, um, so I would probably very early on be very proactive and start uh, and get an attorney who's um, experienced in not just divorce but experienced in when a when a parent is not compliant and there may be a risk of parental alienation. Boy, oh boy, that, um, I mean, that basically confirms what I've heard from a number of other people that the courts just aren't, aren't very good about staying focused on the best interest of the child, which they say that's what they're all about. But in these kinds of cases where clearly the child is being used as a pawn to, uh, in, the, in the disputes between the parents, the courts seem reluctant to get involved. Well, the courts are outdated. I mean, the family court is outdated. And I always said to even have the word family in court in the same sentence doesn't even feel normal. Like that they shouldn't even, they shouldn't even go together. There, there has to be a better system 
for, um, and you know, this is why we do legislative work, right? It's a, to try to get some of this changed, but there, there needs to be a system when a parent hasn't seen their children for no good reason, because even if there's an investigation going on where you got the guardian ad litem involved and all of that, uh, but that can still be, by the time they write their report, and you could have really a year go by before some people actually see their children, which is a disgrace. I mean, it's, again, barring abuse or neglect or any of those things, it, it, it's, it's egregious that in 2020, heading into 2021, that we still have cases where parents don't have contact with their children because they're waiting on the court to help them. And, and not waiting uh, short periods of time. These are quick, I mean, these are long periods of time where when they really should be handled expeditiously because children are not with their parent. Yes. So, uh, very um, but the court is not your friend in, the, in these cases. You really mm. have to push, push it. Mm. You have to be proactive. Right. Um, you know, I could express some of the kind of frustration you just mentioned here. Here's, I'm going to read a little bit of what our, um, quite the person submitting this question said. Okay. Um, clearly involving the police is not the way to handle such matters, but by courts taking no action, the problem perpetuates, never gets resolved. Yep. And unfortunately, in some cases leads to violence. Additionally, I do not believe filing an appeal would get resolution to such action either outside of pissing off the judge for objecting to their, quote, check the box off the docket, figure it out for yourself, end quote, behavior when two people cannot co-parent. So, you know, it's it's very frustrating. Uh, as I just wanted to to get the words. Yeah, about, and I, you know, listen, and co-parenting co as I've, and I've said this last week, you co-parent when you're married, you need to co-parent when you're divorced. Mm -hmm. That never changes. It's the same setup, mom, dad, <laughs> whether you live in the same house or not is, it's not relevant. I mean, you're still a mother and you're still a father and you still have the responsibilities that go along with that. And you should still be able to exercise your right to be a parent um, without having a court come in or without having your, your ex-spouse say, um, well, I don't want him or I don't want her to see the children. Uh, you can't just do that. That's my opinion too, but unfortunately it happens. But the court, and that's why I say the courts are not in favor. There isn't an, um, a system in place that provides for families to maintain connection with both parents, again, barring any abuse, um, but there is not a system in place that speeds it along because what happens is one person doesn't want the other one to have them. And then you get guardian ad litems, the kids got to go to therapy, then we got to do the parent for a family therapy with the mother and then the father and this goes on and on. And so the only time the other parent sees the children really is in that therapy office, which then really messes up the kids. This, this is not a system, family court is not a system where it really benefits. A family, when I say family court, I'm talking about divorce court is not a system where it benefits children. But court certainly can be helpful for juveniles and other things. And, and I'm sure we could have a whole program on why that's broken. But just for divorce, it's not set up to expeditiously re, you know, keep, keep parents with their children. You know, a, a major objective of the Shared Parenting Council of Connecticut is to change the hearts and minds of people, to change the attitudes people have when they go into uh, these separation and uh, the shared parenting situations. They're to change it so that they understand from the very beginning that it's in the best interest of their children to somehow work it out and to um, maintain a good relationship of the children with the other parent. Well, uh, again, we that's going to go law. back. 
I'm sorry, John, go ahead. Yeah, we got that written into law in 2005. There is mm -hmm. factor six in the 16 factors that are the judges are supposed to use. Says that the judge should consider the willingness and ability of each parent to facilitate the uh, good relationship between the child and the other parent. Um, and factor seven is discouraging alienation. It basically says that the court should negatively consider any attempt by either parent to involve the children in the parents' disputes. And if the judge is really focused on those two things, we, I don't think we'd have these problems or we wouldn't have as, as much anyway. And if and we could change the where, attitudes of people when they come in. Right, and that's where education comes in. And that's where like, this passion of mine, I think that attorneys, judges, uh, mediators, therapists, you can go to a therapist, uh, doesn't mean that that person's trained in divorce. And so I think you really need to educate um, all the professionals that are, are involved. So they really understand. I don't think all professionals, all judges understand, you know, what the criteria is for parental alienation, never mind attorneys. Um, and you can go to a divorce attorney, but you don't know if that what training that divorce attorney has had. I think there should be a criteria met to call yourself a divorce attorney. Right. I think guardian ad litems is another part of the problem because again, they're not trained very well. And I think often in these situations where there's non-compliance, the judge will say, okay, I'll call in a guardian ad litem. Let's assign a guardian ad litem. They'll go, they'll, they'll sort this out. But they're not trained in parental alienation. Well, guardian ad litems are typically attorneys. Attorneys typically are not trained in mental health. And when you have two parents who can't get along, that's more of an emotional thing than a legal thing. And so now you've put legal professionals trying to solve emotional issues. Makes no sense to me. Yeah, Just so this is a major, <laughs> major problem. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate your, your um, experience and your, your uh, advice on these things. Well, I do think, John, just to keep in mind for people is that you can call your local police, but don't be disappointed when they aren't going to help you in a way that you think that they're there to help you. Well, a story I just heard from, from a man is that he was the um, object of the violence. His wife was abusing him physically in front of the kids. And um, he, he did call the police eventually after it got really bad. And the police came and told him that he could get arrested, that he shouldn't be calling that. I guess maybe kind of saying he should man up and or something. I don't know. I don't know quite well, there is um, certainly there's, there's a little gender bias there with thinking that men can be abused, but we all know, or shouldn't say we all know, it is clear that that does happen. And there's a lot of shame around that for, for a man. Um, and certainly he doesn't want to hit the, his partner back. And so um, calling the police is a great option. And then they show up and they're like, really, dude, like <laughs> she's hitting you, look at you, you're six, two, or you know what I mean? Like, uh -huh. or whatever. And so it's very difficult for men to um, share that they've uh, that they're being abused by the by a spouse, or to do anything about it. Um, right. In that case. Yes. So those. Do you have anything else, John? Uh, there's there's another person on the call. Maybe I don't know if he has any questions for us. So I think that might wrap it up then. Unless All right. Any other questions? Perfect. Perfect. Um, then till next week. And yes. we'll, uh, you know, look, I'll look forward to answering anything else I, I can. And um, I hope you have a great rest of your week, John. Thanks. And thank you, you for too. coming on Probably. tonight, all those who did. And if you want to uh, share with anybody, please let them know that this will be posted, that you can find it on Shared Parenting uh, Council of Connecticut's YouTube channel. And um, just keep us in mind for next week. Wonderful. All Thanks right. Thanks again. You, so long. Goodbye. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.